so as I told you last time, we looked at, we found out that the business was in an alternate reality. Okay, we had almost gone to another universe. But some of these changes did not only happen when COVID-19 or the coronavirus hit us. They were happening gradually over time. We called it generational change. But then they got supercharged when the pandemic hit us. So in part one, we looked at the political and social alternate reality. We looked at things such as you know, flattening the curve, cancels culture, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, all of these issues we, we covered. These, as I told you, were already happening, but they were essentially supercharged when the new normal of COVID-19 hit us. So we covered 35 shades of this new normal in, the, in part one. And now we are going to look at nine more shades uh, covering the area of economics in this area. Okay, so the nine further shades, and I'm going to call it crazy nomics because you see that the world of economics seems to have gone crazy. Okay, so before we look at crazy nomics, let's look at the development of macroeconomic philosophy and policy. Okay, let's, we started with what is known as the Keynesian economics. John Maynard Keynes wrote a book in 1936 called The General Theory of Employment, Interest and Money. That really was the cornerstone and governments followed the book for a long, long time and it worked. Okay, essentially that when there's a downturn, governments are supposed to run large deficits by spending more money than they took in in terms of taxes to prop up the economy. And the expectation was that when things got better, they were able to repay these loans. Now, many of the spending was by the government for structure. In other words, roads, uh, bridges, dams, and so on. They were really, the government was funding those infrastructures. Okay, so essentially, we increased government expenditure, reduced the taxes, and hopefully that will that have enough money with the people who are working on these infrastructure projects to be able to buy more things and therefore stimulate demand. Now, the problem was that in about 1970s, Keynesian economics encountered some problems. First of all, there was both high inflation and high unemployment. Now they couldn't understand this. Why? Because yes, if there is more money for people to spend and there's a limited amount of goods being produced and the prices will go up but that is what we call inflation but why is it that people are also unemployed okay if there's a demand for goods and services then companies and so on should be hiring people and therefore one should have employment but Normally they move in opposite directions, but this time they actually move together. And that was given a new name called stagflation. So we now had the next economist who came up and that was Milton Friedman, who came and said, no, no, no. What Keynes was doing is not right. What we should do is what is called monetarism. Okay, he said that the problem is that if you only start spending money, without looking at the underlying structural issues, okay, it will result in inflation, but it will not bring unemployment down. Now, why is that? He said, according to his theory, which he won a Nobel Prize for, by the way, is because people came to expect increases in prices. There was an expectation that prices will rise, so therefore prices rose, sort of a behavioral aspect to Keynesian theory. That's why they were saying that despite, you know, our situation of unemployment, there was still inflation. So Friedman argued that governments had a minimum role to play. He said government should not get involved in this area. They should not increase the money supply to stimulate the economy. So essentially, if you look at the two theories, Keynesian theory essentially says that gov governments must get heavily involved in getting involved in this area, but monetarism said they had a minimum role, okay, that, and there was no long run trade off between unemployment and inflation. So that was the counter. Now, the, what 
key, what uh, Friedman was saying was, or other monitor is, that policymakers are focusing too much on equality of income and wealth, too much on income equality and wealth equality. And if you do that, they said, it reduces economic efficiency, hence there are not enough jobs and so on. So he said, you need to give it back to the companies and others to manage the business, to manage the economy. So they said that focusing on the two basics of low and stable inflation would in the long run create the conditions in which living stand with the rise to everyone. So he said, attack inflation. How can you attack inflation? Well, they said, reduce the supply of money. Okay. So essentially, they crushed the money supply. They, they crushed inflation, sorry, by constraining the money supply. And there was a time in the 1980s where when I had to get a housing loan, it was costing me 18% interest. We talk about what interest are now, interest rates are now 18% interest. So people were having to pay a lot of money to get their hands on money, a lot of interest, and therefore they constrained the supply of money. And it worked. It worked for some time, okay? It worked in, in terms of, sorry, I should say, it worked in terms of reducing the prices, but it sent unemployment soaring. Okay, so now we can come to what's happening today, but this happened even before the COVID-19. Okay, the dominant paradigm of monetarism began to show strain after the global financial crisis of 2007 and 9. That is when we had all these subprime mortgages. The policymakers are confronted with two big problems. One is how to increase aggregate demand in the economy. When, we, when economists talk about aggregate demand, they mean how can we get people to buy things? How can we get people to buy? So that was one problem. The second problem was how can you distribute the money in an equal manner? Okay. So in the monetarism, what they did was they didn't distribute it equally. Those who could afford got a lot of money to do all sorts of things, but many of them could not get any of their money. So let's look at the first problem. The first problem was because the aggregate desire to spend relative to the aggregate desire to save seemed to have been permanently reduced by the crisis. So the problem was the subprime mortgage was such a hit that the desire to save was much stronger than the desire to spend. So they had to somehow do something about it. To fight the downturn in spending, central banks slashed interest rates and launched what is called quantitative easing. Now, another term for quantitative easing is money printing. Now, it's not that they actually print physical notes. They give a... Uh, uh, electronic transfer to banks, okay, electronically to increase their ability to spend that money, okay, and give the loans to people themselves. So quantitative easing is where you buy government bonds and other financial assets for the purpose of injecting liquidity into the economy. Now, normally, governments use quantitative easing to buy from itself. In America, there is a central bank called the Fed, and there is a treasury. Okay, that issues the treasury notes. So the central bank buys the treasury notes, okay, releasing more money into the system. But later on, I'll tell you that the central bank in the US started buying things outside treasuries. Okay, we talk about that later. So anyway, basically quantitative easing is pumping money into the economy, huge sums of money. So essentially, the governments are feeding and feeding the banking system but unfortunately, it is not getting down to the people. So the equality, equity issue was not addressed. Simply gave the money to the banks, money then gave it to the people that they wanted it to be given to, okay, big companies, big corporations, and the poor people didn't get it. Okay, now when you increase the supply of money, a few things happen. Okay, you can understand even simple economies say you increase the supply, okay? And if the demand hasn't changed, then prices will go up. But it was not going up, okay? In classical economic supply demand model, printing money should cause rampant inflation. We saw that happening in Germany after World War II. 
We saw it happening in more recent times in Brazil and so on, where uh, the money, Venezuela money had no value because the printed money was worth nothing. Okay. This is because printing more money does not increase economic output. It only increases the amount of cash circulating in the economy. Okay, so you're pumping, pumping, pumping cash into the economy. And I like this cartoon, okay? If you feed banks enough dollars, something good is bound to come out at the other end. Something, something good is going to come out, okay? Where we know something is going to come out, but if it's good or not, we are not too sure about. Okay, so if more money is printed, consumers are able to demand more goods. But if firms still have the same amount of goods, then they will respond by putting up prices. That's what we said, inflation. So the theory, classical theory was more money printed, prices will go up. But it did not happen. The USA kept on printing money. I mean, the USA went off the gold standard in 1970 under Nixon, okay? And today for one US dollar, you get another US dollar. That's all they're guaranteeing, okay? And they simply, started printing, printing money during Obama's time. They actually came to the limit of what the Congress had said should be printed and they doubled it and now they've gone and doubled it again. So you can imagine how much of money is being printed. Okay, but still there was low inflation. Eventually labor markets boomed, but inflation remained muted. Crazy nomics, we can't understand it. Inflation and unemployment are once again not behaving as expected Though this time they were both surprisingly low. In other words, both were low, both inflation and unemployment. So this is the first sign of the emergence of crazy economics. But remember this was happening before COVID-19. Now there were other signals that came, that go supercharged during COVID-19, the massive size of government borrowing. Okay. Between March, 2008 and December, 2019, the US Fed, which is a central bank, balance sheet in terms of total assets ballooned from 900 billion to 4.5 trillion. I mean, that's an amazing increase in the money supply. Okay. They were simply pumping, pumping, pumping money into the system. But this brings up another shade of crazy nomics that this money printing, just like it didn't cause inflation, did not cause high exchange rates or changes in exchange rates. In fact, the US dollar kept being a high, highly wanted currency. Okay, so if you increase the amount of US dollars, the US dollar versus other currencies should fall. But in the case of the US dollar, that did not happen. It should, it should have depreciated, it didn't. Okay, against all economic theory, even as the supply of dollars increased fivefold, the global demand for the US dollar also increased. That's strengthening it against most currencies. Now, just about three or four days ago, we've seen a dip of US dollar. Maybe they're worried about Trump getting back, or who knows, or maybe worried that Trump will not get back. Okay, whatever. And there's a huge amount of money in the system, and they're already planning to double it once again. The US dollar has taken a dip, and the Australian dollar and so on has gone up but not to the extent of four, you know, five-fold changes. So despite huge amounts of money being put into the system, the US dollar's exchange rate seems to be holding. Okay, crazy nomics. So here's a good cartoon. I think the government is preparing for massive inflation. He says, why is that? The dollar has a use by date. In other words, just like a milk carton, okay, use by date in a dollar. Okay, it hasn't happened yet. Okay, but it could well happen if they keep on pumping money into the system. Okay, now let's look at an interesting crazy scenario that has come about. Okay, so US purchased billions of dollars of goods from China and paid for them via quantitative easing. So China's hard workers made all these products and US bought it by simply printing money and giving it to China quantitative easing. China was not unhappy because the US dollar was accepted around the world. They could buy their raw materials and they could do lots of things. So China used this money to improve the infrastructure. If you see the amount of bridges and dams and roadways, amazing that has come up 
okay, in the last 10 years. Okay, amazing. So they improved the infrastructure, but they still had enough money to loan the money to other countries for the Belt and Road Initiative. And Sri Lanka's Hambantota area was one area where loans are given and now it is owned by the Chinese. So they had enough money to go to Africa, Indonesia, Myanmar, all these countries and loan money. In fact, they even signed a deal with Australia's Victorian government. That's a government in the state that I'm in, although the federal government is now saying that they're going to rescind that agreement. So they had enough money for the Belt and Road Initiative that is building all these infrastructures around the world, okay? But they still had enough money to buy real estate around the world. Prices in my own area have gone up three, four times because of the Chinese investors in real estate, not only in real estate, but also in companies, some of them highly sensitive. Now, after spending all this money, they still had money left over. What did they do? They sent the US dollars back to USA to buy treasury bonds. Okay, so the US treasury then printed the bonds and sent it back to China. So everything on printed money. US prints money sent to China, China does all these things and sends it back to USA and USA prints and sends it to China. So the balloon is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, and one day, one day. <clears throat> so here's what, how the US affects, the, uh, how China affects the US economy. It's the largest foreign holdout to US treasuries. <clears throat> China buys US debt to support and value of the dollar. Can you imagine this dollar is propped up because of the Chinese? I told you that the dollar hasn't fallen. A lot of that is propped up because of that. And China is America's largest banker. And that therefore gives it a lot of leverage. Now, of course, <clears throat> Donald Trump might say, we are going to rescind all Chinese treasury bonds. Any treasury bond held by China, maybe like China took over all American companies when Mao Zedong came in. America might do that if there's a real conflict between the two countries. So it's a very dangerous situation. Here's another crazy situation. It's a, often these cartoons pick it perfectly. China is not buying. So I got a bailout money from, borrowed from China. Okay, so this farm is not being able to sell because China is not buying his produce, but giving him enough money borrowed for him to keep going. Okay, perfect scenario perfect of crazy nomics. Okay, now remember I told you about the second problem, that is of the distribution of wealth. I said there was a problem there. After the uh, subprime mortgage collapse, which is we call the post financial crisis problem. Okay, the financial crisis is called the GFC, the global financial crisis. But today we have a bigger crisis on our hands. So essentially, people are getting short change. The amount of money that the governments were giving were going to the banks, not enough for the people. Concern about the cost of globalization and automation help boost populist politics. Of course, this was made use of by politicians. Donald Trump being the famous Make America Great Again was saying, look, y'all are not having any money, not because we are spending money on profits and so on. That is because the Chinese have taken your jobs. Okay, so this Make America Great Again was, was also one of the things that came up because of this uh, area of globalization. <clears throat> Economists ask in whose interest capitalism has been working. Some worry that big firms have become too powerful. In Australia, we're now trying to tax Google and Facebook. I don't think they get far, but they're trying to do that. Others worry about a globalized society that was too sharp-edged that or the social mobility was declining. So because of this concern, at least the Americans did a show recently where they got the CEOs of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, called the big four really. They were grilled by the US Congress about their competitive tactics during the high profile antitrust hearings. They commenced in July, 2020, okay, months ago. Uh, is also trying to do this, but essentially, I think they, they are simply too powerful to do anything. Okay, so COVID-19 was the final death blow to monetarism. In other words, suppressing supplies, okay, trying to control inflation. It actually destroyed monetary economic policy with the force of a nuclear bomb. Okay, Supply chains and production were disrupted simultaneously. 
This resulted in both raw materials and finished goods becoming harder to come by in every country simultaneously. This should have caused prices to surge, but notwithstanding some short-term profiteering in essential goods, prices remain stable. So despite us thinking that prices should go up, prices remain stable. In other words, there was not significant inflation. So essentially put monetarism to rest. Now the bigger impact of the pandemic has been the on the demand side, causing the expectation for future inflation and interest rates to fall even further. People are worried. What are we going to do with our money? Okay, we can't put it in the bank because there's hardly any interest there. People are wanting us to spend, but we want to be safe. Okay, so the desire to invest has plunged. People across the rich world are now saving much of their income. In fact, there was an article in the newspapers the other day that people are holding the $50 Australian notes. The $50 Australian notes are simply being taken off the banks and put it under the bed. Okay, huge amount. So they're not spending. In fact, there's nowhere to spend. Everyone is in lockdown. So you can see over the years how inflation and household savings has gone down. Okay. So essentially, you would expect that if people want to spend money, okay, then, then they would be, you know, if there's a low interest rate, then why, why save it? I mean, no point saving it, let's spend it. But that's not happening. Throughout the years, you can see it has been a downward slope. So really, <clears throat> there is a great concern <coughs> about the need to get back to full, full employment. In countries around the world today, unemployment is now a big issue. How do you get back to full employment? Even before COVID-19, policymakers started to focus again on the great effect of a bust and boom business cycle on the poor, okay? And on the consequences in terms of distribution of wealth. But with the advent of COVID-19, as the economy has been hit with the crisis that hurts the poorest hardest, a new sense of urgency has emerged. Devising new ways of getting back to full employment is once again the top, top priority for economists. So how do we do this? How do we get back to full employment? We're currently, currently the Australian government, the US government and so on is pumping in huge amounts of money to us personally. In Australia, if you are a wage holder, you can get either a job keeper or a job seeker allowance to keep going at least is, I think now it's still October or something. They're pumping huge amounts of money to us directly with the hope that we'll buy more stuff. Spend, spend, spend. But where are we going to buy the stuff if you're under lockdown? So most people are simply saving. Demand has not got stimulated. So that is not working. The of simply giving people money to spend is not working. Now, one interesting sideline on this is that governments, surprisingly, are giving us money, are spending money on people. They were not always like that. <clears throat> this enormous fiscal stimulus by governments around the world has calmed markets, stopped businesses from collapsing, and protected household income, at least in some of the economies that are having the governments to prop them up. Okay, so essentially, this fiscal stimulus is either to cut taxes, to get their afford to people to spend more or raise the government spending to get them to take the money and spend. So the whole idea is stimulate demand, get them to spend, either spend their tax cut or spend their saving. So there's hoping that because the interest rates are low, there's no incentive for people to save. That's the thinking, but it's not happening. This has proved wrong that government policymakers cannot fight downturns. They can. So the monetary said, Ask governments to, you know, don't, don't get involved. The governments need to get involved and COVID-19 has proved that it must get involved. So that's a good thing that they got involved. It has created a new normal that was unimaginable prior to COVID-19, that governments would actually place health and safety of its citizens above politics and close the economy down despite significant resistance from its populace many of whom lost their sources of income. So there was a lot of resistance, especially for younger people, from businesses, don't close the economy down, okay? But most governments, at least in the, even in the developing countries, close their businesses down. 
Okay, so that's interesting. But for how long can governments keep doing this? How long can they keep on spending money with a stimulus package? If they can't go on forever. So we need is true structural reform, and clearly we need to get back to Keynesian economics. Okay. Governments had to weigh up the risk of which policy to choose from in the post COVID-19 world. There are many choices. Widespread central bank intervention in asset markets, which is called monetary policy, getting involved in the asset markets. Ongoing increases in public debt or a shakeup of the financial system, including tax, which is called fiscal policy. And these two are what they're using, the two levers, but that's not enough. We need a third one which is your actual infrastructure, building of infrastructure. We need that also to happen, which is back to Keynesian economics. So we need all three levers, structural reform, monetary policy, and fiscal policy, okay, together. And governments have to start building infrastructure again, go into roads, bridges, whatever. China ignored all the monetarism and used all the money they got to do what Keynesian was saying to do, to get their economy going. Okay, now let's look at some side issues of this policy. First of all, negative interest rates. Now that is a brave new world for finance. In 2014, so well before COVID-19, many central bankers of the opinion that only an interest rate below zero could force the release of savings and generate enough demand to stimulate an economy. Okay. What does this negative interest rate mean? I mean, at face value, it means that you get more money. If you borrow money, the bank will give you money to take your money. Okay, to take a loan, they will give you money. Okay, now this point of where you get interest rates so low that people is take the money out and spend is difficult because people are now taking the money out and putting on the mattress, as we saw with the run on the US on the Australian $50 note. So the, how to get that balance is very, very difficult. And it appears that many, many countries, including Australia, have not got to that, okay? The concept of negative interest has turned the world of finance on its head. So let's look at what this means, okay? As I told you, if you deposit money of $1 in the bank, you get 10 cents at the end, okay? No compound interest. The compound interest rate becomes negative. So that means time has no value in money, okay? Earlier, you deposit something, today, $1, you compound interest, you get the $1.10 at the end, okay? But if interest rates are negative, theoretically, a company can borrow money from banks and get paid by the bank for taking the loan. Interest rates will no longer be expense, but a revenue source. That is, the more a company borrows from the bank, the more profit it can make. Now, it hasn't come to this yet. At the moment, negative interest rates merely means that the central banks are paying uh, the merchant banks and so on to uh, pay money for them to take money. But when it, when it flow on to the consumer, if it does, we, we, the whole of finance has turned on its head. Capital budgeting decision rules will be reversed. Okay? We have something called the weighted average cost of capital with the combination of the risk-free rate the share market rate and the cost of debt, okay? So we have something that we say that the risk-free rate is lower than the return on the market. But if the risk-free rate actually is going to be negative, in other words, you get money for taking money, then the whole uh, graph turns the other way around where the risk-free rate is higher than the return on the market, okay? So how are we going to make decisions is going to be an interesting thing for academics to consider. Okay, so that is negative interest rates. Then we are getting more new types of financial institutions. The rise of what is called shadow banks. This also happened after the global financial crisis of the subprimes, okay? Because banks got into so much trouble, there was a run on many banks. They became very, very risk averse. But this meant that other tech-savvy shadow banks, non-banks called shadow banks, are stepping up with new wave of innovation and capital markets. So they are bypassing the banking system and doing direct lending, okay? These are things like hedge funds, uh, money market funds, and so on, 
that are essentially going direct to the market. So long established institutions like pensions and insurance funds, private equity funds, okay, these are essentially now taking up the role that was earlier, the investment role of banks, traditional banks. But this has caused another problem. As I told you, there's an oversupply of money. The money is not going to the correct quarters, okay? When the coronavirus pandemic hit, the capital markets seized up. Rather than acting as a lender of last resort to the banks, the Fed, that is the central bank in America, became the market leader of last resort, intervening in credit markets with massive capital injections. The US Treasury, the US uh, Fed, the central bank, actually went into companies even and bought up company stocks. They went into Apple and so on. Okay, these all under Donald Trump, remember? Okay, so they became a market maker. In other words, they were able to dictate the price of uh, shares and uh, debentures and so on in companies. Okay, huge amount of money was put into the system. Okay, huge amounts of money. So this has resulted in a perverse new normal in that even as millions of USA citizens lost their jobs, and are worried about how to get food and pay the rent, banks and other banks are awash with cash. They have all this cash. It's not going down to the poor people who need the money to buy food and pay rent. Okay. Such cash is finding its way into exotic investments and fire sale purchases of companies distressed in the wake of the pandemic. So in Australia, we had American private equity company called Bain Capital that made a big a successful bid to buy a distressed airline called Virgin Australia or Virgin Atlantic. Okay, This is what's happening. The money is not going to the people, it's going to private equity and so on for investment purposes. So this is a very good cartoon that when things are going good, all the companies are saying, hey, governments don't get involved, you know, monetarists, you, you have no say in the matter. But the moment things get bad, they're all lining up for their share of the money. Even Virgin Australia wanted billions of uh, Australian taxpayer money to bail it out and the Australian tax government said no, and that's only when they went to Bain Capital. Okay, so there is this cash and conquer, okay, situation. Because of all this money, okay, we're having today a recession, but the stock market is going up. Okay, this oversupply of money now produces some unusual developments in financial markets, challenging some historic correlations. With the spread of the virus showing no signs of abating, almost all economies are in recession. A recession means two successive quarters of negative growth. So Australia has just announced that we are into recession after something like 20 years. Okay. So the economy is going down. Traditionally, in a recession, investors are looking for safe investments, have sought refuge in treasury bonds. But what's the point of buying treasury bonds? They are giving zero interest. In fact, some countries negative interest. Okay, they are of no value at all. So where can we park the money? Well, the only place to park the money seems to be the share market. And therefore, share markets have boomed. Also, there are a couple of day traders, people who had nothing to do because they were at home without going to work. They started investing in shares as well. You know, buy at 10 o'clock, sell at 10.05, okay, and so on. So the share markets have surged. Okay. Along with the surge in share markets, other markets have also gone up. The copper price has surged. Now, copper price and share markets all traditionally go up together, so they're perfectly correlated. But share markets going up have been negatively correlated with the price of gold and silver. But here, gold and silver is also going up. Okay, crazy nomics. Now, why is that? That's most likely because we can't find the treasury bonds as a store of value. We don't trust the share markets. So there are people who are simply buying gold and silver for a rainy day. Okay, those in India and Sri Lanka and so on would very much understand this. You keep the gold for a rainy day. Okay, a store of value. Okay, so you can see that it's uh, complete. The coronavirus is hitting all the countries in a recession. The stock market is booming. And even some of the commodities, gold, silver, copper, 
they are booming. So again, we are having, there's a reason for it, huge oversupply of money, okay, is the reason we are seeing all these crazy things happening in the economy. Okay, so in summary, part one of the series covered the political and social alternate reality in the world that the world finds itself in. This one, we showed that traditional microeconomic policy that worked in previous crises could no longer be relied upon. And there was evidence of the emergence of what can only be described as crazynomics. Okay. So in the next part, I'm going to look at some of the impacts of global interconnection. Now the interconnections are both logistical, the supply chains that all got disrupted, but also how that has impacted on the weather patterns and also on other patterns like our um, whether the, the, the sea movement of water, okay, the transatlantic current, current and so on, we're going to see how they're all interconnected and how they were going to be, how they have been impacted. That is for next week. Okay, everyone. So I hope you've um, found something of value. Now, please uh, enter your questions and I will take them one by one and answer them. So thank you very much. <laughs>